Fulte Goji on Breton Verg, Agos Fulte Goji on Oriachtas. Uh, we're very happy to have you here and thank you for coming to join our conference. Thank you, delighted to be here. Nice to see everybody. I hope you're having a great conference. We are indeed. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to your contribution today. Um, I'm going to ask you both, first of all, and if I can start with you, please, Michelle, what's shaped your politics and driven you into wanting to be First Minister of your respective legislature? Well, I suppose when I was growing up, I don't think I ever thought for one second that I would be First Minister. <laughs> 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 That's for sure. I, I grew up in a society that was very divided. I grew up in a society that uh, was engineered in such a way that someone from, like me, from my background, a nationalist, would never be at the helm of the executive. So um, when you grow up in that sort of scenario, um, I was always an activist from a, from a very young teenager. Um, you grew up in a society that was you know, built with in, an inbuilt unionist majority. Um, discrimination was the name of the day. Catholics need not apply was the name of the day. Um, you know, no to jobs, uh, no to voting. Um, all the principal things that, that you, know, you should have access to. And I suppose, I suppose for me as a teenager growing up in that, I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to be part of the change that was required. And I suppose even as far back as my, my grandparents, my granny would have been part of the civil rights movement. Um, my father then was elected in, in local government for Sinn Féin um, at a time whenever you know, it was very dangerous to be uh, openly a Sinn Féin member, to be elected for Sinn Féin. At that time, um, loyalist paramilitaries were murdering Sinn Féin councillors. Mm. Um, but I could see what my daddy did in a very local way. You know, I could see that he stood up for people, that he represented the community that he came from. And I thought, well, you know, I, could, I could be part of that. I could do something about that. And, Obviously, as a United Irelander, then Sinn Féin was the, the vehicle in which to pursue that. And, you know, I've held many positions across the party um, down through the years. I've been a local government councillor. Um, obviously, I'm an MLA, um, now First Minister-elect, um, yet to be respected. And I, I, um, I suppose from the Good Friday Agreement was signed, and I always say I represent the Good Friday Agreement generation. And when it was signed back in 1998, I became a full-time activist working for the party uh, in the constituency of Mid-Ulster, where I, I now proudly represent. And Martin McGuinness would have been the, the representative in that area at the time, so himself and Francie Malloy, I would have worked with them. So I've always been, all of my adult life's been about the, the peace process, it's been about the Good Friday Agreement, been about all the progress that's been you know, brought about over the course of the last 25 years. And I suppose it's a very privileged position, as we know, to represent people and to try to do your best by people. And I don't see any contradiction at all in being in a locally elected assembly, working with all the other parties in the North, um, at the same time pursuing my ideals, my, the fact that I want to unite the country, unite the people, and bring about constitutional change. And by God, if you look at the efforts in London in the last uh, couple of weeks, that <laughs> makes the case for constitutional change, I think, because the people deserve much, much better than that mm. mess, yeah, dysfunction, yeah. and just chaotic politics. Mm. <laughs> and obviously, you're very much focused a first minister for all. So that signals a huge change in terms and shift in terms of narrative for the North as well. It does. I mean, um, I would never want to see what was done to people in the past. That could never be repeated. And I said throughout the whole of the election campaign that I can be a first minister for all, that I have no desire to govern for one community over another, that I want to be able to represent everybody. And I, I want to do that and prove that every day in what I do. Um, that's what people deserve. They deserve politicians working together. They deserve good public services, they deserve, whenever they elect people, that you're actually, that you're there to do the right thing for them, to make the best decisions you can for them. Um, so very much so, that's where I want to be. Unfortunately, um, as I said, the election result hasn't been respected. Six months ago, you know, we had a very historic election, as I said, like the North was built with an inbuilt unionist majority. It was never supposed to be the case that, you know, that a nationalist would come to the fore as first minister. And, the DUP are blocking the formation of an executive because they don't like the election result. Um, that's that's the, the honest truth of it. Um, now it looks like we're going to face another election because of their, the, their failure to join with the rest of us and actually make politics work. We shouldn't have to fight an election. The public have voted. They have had their say. Um, but that being said, the rules are that if you don't form an executive that you have to go to an election. 
Now, is that going to happen? I couldn't sit here today and say for sure that it will, because again, um, it's all caught up in what's happening in London and that mess and that chaos. And um, so we don't even know who will be the, the prime minister come Monday. Um, and I just think that the arrogance of the Tories, um, you know, it's all about their own survival. It's all about holding on to power. It's certainly not about people. Um, they're, they're not sitting. I'm quite sure they're not sitting worried about how they're going to put food on their table um, or keep <laughs> the heating on. They're not taking decisions how they're going to ration food and, and heat. And, you know, I just think it, it's just pure madness. And I think if ever there, there is a case um, for us to do better for the public, then I think breaking the ties with the union um, is the way to do it. And I think yeah. that's something that we share. <laughs> Thank you. And Adam, if I can ask you a similar question uh, as we started with Michelle, in terms of your own background, what, what's inspired you to want to be First Minister? Uh, well, there's, there's an apocryphal story that my mother te tells me, and I'm not one to contradict my mother <laughs> ever, uh, <laughs> that uh, Jim Callaghan, the Labour Prime Minister in the 1970s, visited Ammonford, my, my hometown, uh, I think to open the, the, the Betos mine that... Uh, well, my father went on to work in and then Thatcher closed. Um, and uh, we were coming out of the co-op, you know, and then there was, uh, you know, the cameras behind him, etc. And he came on to me and, with the ca and, uh, and asked me a typical politician question, I suppose. <laughs> uh, what do you, oh, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, uh, uh, young man? And I said, Prime Minister. Uh, <laughs> and he said, oh, and he, they were laughing, oh, you want my job, do you? No, I said, I want to be Prime Minister of an independent Wales. <laughs> and I, was, I, was, I was eight at the time, so activism started early for me. For me. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, in reality, growing up in, 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 in Ammonford, uh, it, back then, um, solid Labour town. And so uh, I, joined, I joined Clyde Cymru, actually, when I, uh, uh, when I was about uh, 13 or 14. Um, and it was the minor strike in particular that uh, radicalised me and got me, you know, fully involved in, in, in politics of this party. I saw that Plaid Cymru was backing the miners and the, and the mining communities more than the Labour leadership at the time. It was politically inconvenient, you know, worried about Middle England and losing voters in, in the centre, etc. So I saw that Plaid was supporting our, our uh, communities 100%, and that's why I, I, I joined Plaid. But you know, I, I, we would have had no hope back, th back then of you know, becoming a Plaid MP. It, was, it wasn't even on your radar, you know, <laughs> uh, because of the nature of the, of the politics uh, of the time. But it just shows we just won a by-election in Ammonford uh, on Thursday. Um, and uh, my hometown has completely, you know, sort of uh, st strongly shifted over to supporting Plaid. And I think the, r the, the roots were there for my generation because, you know, the party as a socialist party was, was really showing the kind of moral leadership mm. that was lacking from uh, the Westminster uh, parties. And, but for us, you know, it's never about personal ambition, isn't it? You know, we do what we do because of, uh, of what it represents for, for, the, for our communities and for working class people. It's a vehicle, isn't it? And mm -hmm. also we're non-hierarchical parties as, as well. We are all equal, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, as a movement and as a party, because that says something. We have different roles, don't we? So when you're in a leadership role, you have a particular, you know, contribution that you, ne you need to make. But actually we are all the same as one part of one uh, movement, every level, all working together, and that says something about the society that we're trying to uh, uh, create as well, where everyone is equally val valued. And that's such a contrast, isn't it, as you were saying, Michelle, to you know, the politics of Westminster, which is it's driven by one thing only, isn't it? It's careerism yeah. and self-interest and you know, the, the way that they are uh, fight, f you know, fighting like ferrets in a sack against each other, that's probably insulting to ferrets, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Better behave ferrets out there, I think. Uh, you know, but what does it say? And, and the danger is, it, is it, it, it crushes people's hope because, as you're saying, you know, people having to make this horrendous choice between heating and e eating, you know, people facing hunger, uh, homelessness and hypothermia at a time when they, they, they deserve leadership from politicians and what, what do they get? Our job is to keep that hope alive Absolutely. and say, 
doesn't have to be this way. There's nothing inevitable about this. You know, the, the, this is created by you know, the, the politics of Westminster, but we actually can create a, a far better future and, and doing it ourselves as United Islanders and Independent Wales. And that hope is so important, isn't it? People have to have hope that there's something better, there's something ahead, even that you have their back. Yeah. You know, you can't always mitigate against all the, the things and the challenges that people are facing, but you can try your best for people. And I think if people can hold on to that wee bit of hope, it's important. Particularly as you see, as you said, you know, the, the Tories in London, it's about themselves, it's about the rich elite, it's not about people, it's not about what's best for people, and it's about self-survival for themselves, you know. So I think that, you know, the, the, the people deserve so, so much better than that, and certainly in our context, I want to bring about a, a change position where we don't have those ties, we don't have those links, that we govern together for each other, because it'll only be ourselves that'll govern in the best, best interests of the people that we represent. So I think that next year, we'll mark our 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. And like, the, the island has been transformed. It's amazing to watch all that change from you know, the 1998, uh, when I was 21 years of age, to where we are today. It's just, it's just night and day in terms of the transformation. But for me, it's all about the future now. It's about change, and it's about the next 25 years. And what does that look like? And we have said this is a decade of opportunity, and we genuinely believe that now is the time to have the, the healthy debate, the conversation around what could be better? What could we achieve together on the island for all of the citizens that live on the island? What could we achieve together that's better? And certainly Brexit has been a big, big catalyst for change. Yeah. You know, it's been a big, huge catalyst for change. <coughs> and the fact that we're being drawn, we've been taken out of Europe against our wishes. Um, the fact that we fought to find some mitigation in the form of this protocol to protect the Good Friday Agreement. And then we have the Tories who signed up to that very deal then trying to wreck it and actually legislating to, to wreck it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just madness, like it's just chao chaotic. So I think that for me, the hope piece comes in the journey ahead. What's the next 25 years look like? Um, but for now, where I want to be is in an executive actually dealing with the challenge of today, which is the cost of living crisis and, you know, and the cost of doing business crisis, because a lot of businesses, small businesses are also find it very difficult to keep their doors open and keep people in unemployment. Um, mm -hmm. So we ha it's, just, it's just beyond belief that um, the DUP would sit out of government and not join the rest of us at a time whenever the people need us, mm -hmm. you know, and I would still, I still make the case that they should, even today, it's not too late to join with the rest of us and actually get at the executive table and try to put workers or money into the, fam the pockets of workers and families. No, certainly I think infighting doesn't benefit anyone. Mm. So uh, can I ask you, Dadam, in terms of, uh, Michelle mentioned some of those drivers for change. <coughs> What do you think in terms of Wales? Where do you see the parallels? How significant do you think Brexit has played in that movement towards or interest in independence here in Wales? Well, it certainly uh, was a, a, key, a key catalyst here yeah, for the huge surge in support for independence, wasn't it? So uh, many people, I think, came to the conclusion that uh, you know, if, if this is the trajectory that, we, that we're on now, you know, an increasingly reactionary right-wing uh, politics, then, you know, we need to find an alternative. And uh, so, uh, and in, in a sense, both in terms of what's happening now is a culmination of this ongoing political and economic crisis that, you know, Brexit was part of. And you can even go back to the, the financial crisis as, as well in 2008 and the failure of the kind of Westminster political establishment to actually, uh, you know, deal with that crisis. We've had, you know, re uh, wages in real terms have stagnated. In fact, they've gone down for public sector w workers. So we've had crisis after crisis, haven't we? The, the financial crisis, austerity, mm. Brexit, um, you know, the way that COVID was mishandled uh, at, at w Westminster, and now the cost of living crisis. We've had basically a generation of, of mm. crisis after crisis, and I think people have, have just said, you know, enough is enough. Enough is enough. We have an al alternative. And so uh, it's partly a response to the chaos, uh, and, you know, and the, 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 the rotten core of the political system at Westminster. But I think, as you were saying, Michelle, there is, there is a... There's a hopeful and a positive track there as well, because people are, are, are thinking, well, what could we be? Mm -hmm. What, you know, if, if not this, what else could we be? And almost as if, you know, 
you, you, you liberate yourself then from the shackles of your imagination, thinking, what, we don't have to put up with, with, all, yeah. put up with, with our crap. I, I've said it on the podium, so I can say <laughs> it again. Like, there we are, I'm liberated myself, look. Uh, we don't have to put up with that crap. Then what could we put in its place? And the kind of conversations that are happening, they're happening around the kitchen table. They're happening in the, in the pubs and in the, you know, churches and chapels. And they're happening everywhere. And what we're doing as well to try and kind of shape that conversation, contribute to it uh, through what we announced yesterday with the Future Cymru Forum, working with another party as well, because we want to have this, an, uh, we want to make this as wide and open a conversation as possible. Everyone is invited. We need to hear everyone's voice, everyone's ideas, everyone's perspective, everyone's creativity. And you can, you can feel, you know, there's something in the air, isn't there? You know, we've been marching. Um, there's an energy, there's an energy there. Even in the midst of this cost of Westminster crisis, then people as, uh, are, I, I think, inspired mm. by the politics mm -hmm. of the possible. Uh, yeah, and we've seen amazing scenes in Ireland from some of the meetings now. Uh, perhaps you can share with us, and not everyone is on social media, has perhaps seen the thousands of people who are part of that conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's a conversation afoot now that, I mean, I have never saw it before, and, and actually people who've been around a lot longer than me have never saw it before. This conversation around the change, the hope, the alternative, what's better, uh, what's coming at us, and what could we have um, in the years ahead. So there's a lot of groups that have formed um, to actually have these conversations. There's a group called Ireland's Future, which is basically civic society, those people that are um, for Irish unity, and they want to, you know, bring more people into the conversation because none of us own the independence piece. It has to be for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we should never be so precious as to think it's only us because we've campaigned for it for years. <laughs> you actually have to, you have to open the door and let everybody in. And I think one of the strengths of the, the civic conversation that's happening, um, um, they had a big event in Dublin um, about two weeks, three weeks ago. And um, they had thousands of people there from all different walks of life who were all there to pose questions, to ponder, you know, to, be, to hear some of the, the I suppose, the, the opportunities that, that, that lay ahead in terms of Irish independence. And I mean, that's people from just all different walks of life. You had James Nesbitt, an actor, you know, you had um, all different political stripes were represented, which I thought that's a first, you know, it's never happened that people from all different political parties were also represented. And that in itself is a strength. But that to me is testimony to the fact that there's a confidence there, there's an error um, in society where people are for this change, but they want to know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And if, if ever there was a, a way not to do something, Brexit is a very good example, um, we have to plan for constitutional change. You see, you can't just pose a question to people without giving them the facts. So the conversations that we want to have, we want to be involved in are, what does an Irish National Health Service look like? You know, a health service free at the point of delivery, you know, available to everybody. What does education look like? How can we grow the economy? How can we create more and better jobs? How can we ensure that people have a roof over their head? It's all of those um, issues, I think, that people want to talk about. So these conversations that we're having are just, I think, brilliant. And we had our own um, People's Assembly in Belfast um, last week. And that was about 400 people who came along. Um, and these were people who, I don't know, they're new people who, are not new, I suppose new to me, um, who wanted to come into the conversation and just to hear what we were talking about in terms of constitutional change. So that's an unstoppable piece. And sometimes people can be miles ahead of you in politics. And um, I think the people at home are certainly very engaged in the conversation. Because one of our big strengths, I think, and one of the, um, I suppose, one of the really big positives we have in terms of the constitutional change debate is this. We've been taken out of Europe against our wishes, but the European, uh, the European project have said that in the event of a successful unity referendum, we automatically, the North automatically rejoins uh, with the rest of the island. So for a lot of people, the question is, do you want to be part of inward looking Brexit Britain, or do you want to be part of an outward looking inclusive Ireland within Europe? Mm -hmm. and, and for a lot of people, that's a big, big. So, so it's healthy, I think, is, is in short what I'm saying. It's a healthy debate, a healthy conversation. But the Irish government need to plan. Yes. Um, there's a constitutional imperative on the Irish government to plan for constitutional change, to put the meat on the bones, if you like, of those areas that we've that mentioned around, you know, what does it look like? Um, and to date, that hasn't been done enough. And we certainly would want to change that. So we very const are constantly 
um, would make the case to the Irish government um, that they need to change things. But of course, our party has grown from strength to strength. We're a national uh, movement, and um, Mary Lou MacDonald is the, the leader of the opposition in Dublin, and we hope soon to be, if the people support us, um, and we work hard for that, soon to be uh, the Taoiseach. And what we intend to do in that case is to make sure that the preparation and the planning happens. So it's very exciting, I think, actually, for us in terms of our, our journey and where we're headed. Oh, certainly. I think one of the things that's, uh, that's really striking at the moment is the way that uh, uh, the, the parallel conversations that we're having in, in, in Wales, in Scotland, in, in Ireland, um, yeah, the contexts are, are different, nat nat naturally, but also, you know, there, there are points of commonality a, a, as well. So uh, I think we are also at the point where um, we're moving into a new phase in the conversation where people, you know, people are really engaged, they're really interested, they're asking really great questions, you know. Uh, questions and doubts, doubts are good, they should be embraced because they're starting points for conversations and, and, and for asking, okay, what's the work that we need to do in, in those areas? And, uh, you know, we can cross-fertilise as well, can't we? So, we just um, uh, commissioned a piece of work from uh, Professor uh, John uh, Doyle at, at uh, DCU, uh, who'd, who'd been doing some work on, on one of the questions that comes up in the context of uh, United Ireland, which is what is the fiscal starting point or you know, the, the, the fiscal consequences, the fiscal position of Northern Ireland coming into the uh, United Ireland. Uh, and, um, and, and many unionists have argued that there would be a kind of a huge fiscal deficit and he's been able to demonstrate in the context of, the, uh, of Ireland that, that that isn't true. And then we asked him to kind of uh, basically apply the same principles to our own position where mm -hmm. the question of uh, Wales's uh, fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal position is, you know, has always been presented as one of the reasons that we can't, you know, afford independence. Yeah. And he's basically demolished that argument for one, once and for all, I think, by showing that you know, there isn't a 13.5 billion fiscal deficit of an independent Wales, it's around 2.6, which is about, you know, just over 3%, which means that, you know, that's a normal kind of deficit for mo most independent ca countries. So that's a game changer, and it's just one example of why, of, w of, of how actually the, these different conversations that are happening in parallel can also accelerate Absolutely. the pace of progress that we make together. And we all look forward to today, the day when we'll be there, uh, an independent Wales, an independent Scotland, a united Ireland, you know, uh, a, a kind of uh, a Celtic triad of independent <laughs> nations. <laughs> look forward to it. It's a good point on the subvention because, I mean, that's the case that's constantly made to ourselves as well, that, you know, we couldn't afford it. Um, actually, the opportunities are immense. You have to look at it on the flip side. And, and also, I mean, we can't even get proper access to all of the data around mm. the subvention itself. And there's a reason for that, you know, because it's been inflated in terms of, you know, what it costs. So for me, it's about opportunity. Yeah. And if we look at our small island, um, you know, the, the rate of um, wages, for example, are much higher in the south than they are in the north. Our economy in the north is, is you know, whenever the, the, the country was partitioned, the north was this big powerhouse, um, and that was where all the wealth was. That's it's a flip now, you know, um, completely flipped. And so the opportunities, I think, of, of unity are, are brilliant. And it's great to see more and more people from the academic world involved in studies around, you know, breaking some of the myths and actually looking towards the opportunities. And there's been a number of economists have done studies that would suggest that the economic benefit that you'd feel for years in the aftermath of, you know, Irish unity would be, again, would be immense. So it's, it's about opportunity and it's about hope and it's about better. Mm. Yeah. Can I take you back to something you raised earlier, just in terms of an election and a real possibility now, and obviously there is a deadline looming in terms of that. So obviously you can't predict, but what do you think would be different if there was another election? And obviously there could be a general election. Well, we'd like to see a general <laughs> election, but it'd just be interesting just to understand the situation we're in at the moment. Yeah, so we had our election back in May. The public had their say and gave us a mandate, gave me a mandate to be um, the first minister for all. Um, as I said, the DUP have failed to respect that mandate. And the reason that they present for that is that it's because of the protocol and that they don't support the protocol. Of course, the rest of us didn't support Brexit, but that didn't matter. It was still foisted upon us. Um, so they, they make the case that they are staying out of the executive until there's a resolution in the protocol. Now, the protocol's here to stay. It's not going away. So that's, you know, for the birds that, if anybody thinks that it's going to, to leave. 
It has to stay because it has protections in us that, that we need um, to have secured. Now, are there things that can be fixed and ironed out? Yes, there can. But the best way to do that is with an agreed way forward between both the British government and the EU. Um, and we've always made the case for we need to have certainty and stability, which we haven't had for so long since the Brexit debate started. So the, the DUP make the claim that they're not coming back into the executive until this is sorted out. Well, the executive can't sort it out. It's between the two negotiating partners in the British government and the EU. So really, they're holding the society to a ransom for something that's actually not even within the gift of the executive. So um, I just think that's madness. And I think we, the public shouldn't have to go to another election. But the rules are that um, if there isn't one formed by uh, one minute past midnight uh, this Thursday, um, that we have to go to an election. Now, if the DUP were holding out for a deal to be done between the British government and the EU before that date, <laughs> um, you know, the, we're, we're in a scenario where there is no British Prime Minister, so there's no one to make a call, there's no one to make a decision, and there's no one to strike a deal. Now, does any of that change before next Friday? It's unfolding at, at a pace, so how could you keep up? Mm. Um, and, you know, where will we be next Friday? I couldn't honestly say. But will it change anything? No, I mean, I believe the public are very motivated. As I said earlier, they understand why the DUP aren't in the executive, and I believe that it'll be a strong election again, but I don't think the public should have to fight that election because they've already had their say. But those, I suppose, are the rules. But I think anything's possible over the course of, of the next week. Um, I will campaign again as an asking for the mandate to be the First Minister for all, to put money into people's pockets, to support workers and families and businesses to get through this period, to stand up for people, to have their backs. Um, and that's, for, you know, that's ultimately um, how I'll campaign in the election. But the previous election result should be respected, and it's not good enough that it's not, accept it's not accepted. There's one question that I'd like to ask you, Michelle, actually, as, <coughs> as, um, uh, as a First Minister-elect. Um, we've heard from Mark Drakeford and Nicola Sturgeon that uh, <coughs> Liz Truss still is Prime Minister for six days, I suppose, <laughs> uh, has never, has ne hasn't called them. Has she called you? No. Yeah. <laughs> no surprise there. It was a rhetorical no. question. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it says something, isn't it? Yeah. It says something. It's a, it's, it's a symbol of the low contempt that our nations are held in. You know, mm -hmm. It does that. And, and for, you know, from the Tories come into power, not only have they stripped our, our public services of much needed finances, our health service at home is on its knees. I don't know what it's like here, but, um, you know, Tory austerity has hurt. It has hurt people really hard, and it's hurt our public services really hard. And it's stripped, like when I use the health service as an example, it's just stripped it back completely to the bare bones that whenever you faced a, a global pandemic, it was really challenging for the health service and the staff who were absolutely amazing to get us through that, that period. So the Tories are in general have been you know, so bad for people and our peace process wasn't just a, a moment in time. It's a process mm. and it, needs to be, it has to be nurtured in an ongoing way. But the, from the Tories came into power, did a step back, took nothing to do with it mm. and they allowed um, the DUP in particular for, to continue to breach agreements that were made, roll back on progress that was made, you know, and they took a completely hands-off approach. So they haven't been good for the peace process and, and care less about what's been achieved. And I think the fact that they foisted Brexit upon us whenever it wasn't compatible with mm. the Good Friday Agreement is a case in point as to how much the regard they have for what's been achieved. And I'm not prepared to sit back and allow the Tories to roll back on everything that we've achieved in the last 25 years, certainly not, and that's why I want the conversation about the next 25 years to be about a life absent from the Tories. Mm. Yeah. Um, one, thing, one thing that will be of interest uh, for us uh, here in Wales is um, the fact that y you have, albeit limited, but you have some degree of devolution of the administration of welfare in, in Northern Ireland. So if the executive were up and running, you could use those to tools and levers, couldn't you, to, to try and uh, help you know, practically with the cost of living. Uh, yeah, prices. and, and our, our minister actually who's responsible for that will actually say something more about that um, later in the week. But we try our very, very best to mitigate, and that's all you can do, is actually mitigate against the worst excesses of Tory policy. Um, and down through the years, we have been able to find ways to support people. But you know, um, you just don't ha we don't have a, an endless pot of funding to be able to support people. So when you've got a limited mm. amount of money, you've, how you use it's really, really important. 
Um, I certainly believe when you target need and you support people who need it most. Um, so we will continue to do our best to mitigate uh, the worst excesses of the Tory policies that you know, just completely, uh, in no shape or fashion in any way, support the people that need it most. So hoping that the next Prime Minister actually does pick up the phone, <laughs> what will be your message to him or her? Well, the Good Friday Agreement must be respected and um, the approach of the Tories to date has not been in that vein. So what we need is political stability. What we need is an executive up and running. What we need is no kowtowing to the DUP. And what we need is politics to work. We need politics to work. People need support right now. And what I want to see in terms of any discussions between the British government and the EU is to get on with it and actually you know, provide that certainty, provide that stability within the framework of the protocol, find ways to uh, make an agreed way forward and then remove any pretense for the DUP not to come in around the executive table with the rest of us. That's what the public deserve and that's certainly where I want to be. And in terms of where... Well. <laughs> And in terms of Wales, Adam? Well, I think my first m message to the next Tory Prime Minister would be resign. <laughs> uh, please. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, after that, give us our independence referendum. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to resign, are they? I mean, that's the reality no. because they're just driven by self interest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, trust <coughs> up turkeys are not going to vote for Christmas. That's the reality. So I think that we've got to. We've got to keep on, uh, you know, uh, fighting. We've got to, you know, because e e uh, even when the political stakes are against us, you know, the people united will never be defeated. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to show solidarity with working class people, with the trade union movement in p particular. That's how we will defeat. If the Tories insist on, you know, sitting it out in, 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 in Downing Street for the, for the next two years, then I think we've got to get behind the trade union m movement because that's how, how we will win. And if Labour Party is going to sit this out because, you know, they, they, they don't want to be seen on the, the picket lines, then that's where, where our place as a party be, you know, with the nurses, with the teachers, with all those workers that are in struggle at the moment, showing solidarity with them in the here and now, while at the same time having that conversation about a different kind of tomorrow in independent Wales where we could have our socialist values turned into policies, you know, every, every day of the week. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, they're, they're in struggle, there is always hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, these are tremendously difficult times uh, for, uh, for many, many families. But at the same time, you know, the, the fact that, that um, you know, the, uh, trade unions are fighting back, that actually contains within it the seeds of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we, our place is there with them, and we can win some battles even if, you know, they're too frightened to call an election in the meantime. Yeah. Michelle, there's also been a significant demographic shift, hasn't there, well, from the census results <laughs> in terms of the North. So how significant do you think that is as well in terms of the future of the Union? Yeah, I mean, it, it has been quite significant and, um, and very interesting to watch. I think one of the, the strengths we have as a society is that we're far more multicultural than we ever were before. And that's one of the things that's really stark in terms of the census. And for me, you know, I, I want to build and lead in a society that is about, you know, a rainbow of identities. It's about everybody. It's about, you know, inclusive uh, kind of society. And I think that uh, the census actually was, was very stark in terms of, of that. Um, I think you know, the census reflects the change culture that's happening, the, the appetite for change, the fact that just all the old norms are gone and we're in a new space now. Um, so I think that it all bodes well just in terms of the change that I think people will want to, to bring about. And, you know, I totally agree with that. You know, we, we, um, uh, Wales has never been a monolith. You know, there are, there are, uh, there are at least as many ways to be Welsh as there are uh, citizens of this country. And we, we need all of that diversity because that's really, it's, it's our diversity that gives us our strength. Mm -hmm. And that includes, um, that includes the British identity in, in, in Wales. And I know that, uh, Michelle, you've talked about this as, as well. Uh, you know, 
your identity is your identity. It's how you feel, you know, and, uh, and that will continue to be part of, uh, part of the future of, of, of Wales uh, as an independent nation. You know, the problem is not with a, a, a British identity, uh, or a, an, it's actually with the British state. It's, with the, it's about the institutions, the structures, which are not delivering for our nation. And so that's an important message for, uh, you know, for us to say, look, bring your own identity. <laughs> you know, we want you to be part of this party. And um, what a party it will be, by the way, when we become an independent <laughs> nation, because we know how to do it, uh, uh, celebrate, don't we, as, as, as Kelth. But everyone is invited. All of the perspectives, all of the different tra traditions of Wales, they are part of what ma uh, ma uh, makes us. And when we cross that finishing line to become an independent nation, we will do it all together, mm -hmm. all together, um, arm in arm, everyone. Absolutely, absolutely. One of, the, one of the strands of the Good Friday Agreement is that it enshrines the right for us all to be identified as British, Irish, both, neither. And for me, uh, the unification of the island has to be a unity of all the people on the island. And that way, you have to ensure that people have their identity protected. Um, so those of our British identity have to feel part of and valued in society and, and, those, and alongside those of an Irish identity and any other identity that makes Ireland their home. So for me, that is so important. It has to be inclusive. It has to be for everybody and everybody has to feel part. Thank you very much. You. I'm afraid our time has come to an end. Thank you, Adam, and thank you so much, Michelle. And we look forward, hopefully, to well, welcoming you back as First Minister <laughs> following whatever happens. Yeah.